Growing up, I had a friend who from the very beginning in Little League just was a gifted pitcher. And he played all the way through school and high school. Uh, scouts from a couple of teams came and looked at him. I sort of lost track of him for a while, but he was signed to a farm team somewhere. And then for one glorious moment, he went up to the major leagues. I didn't find out about this till afterwards, so I looked up his stats and he had none. He never actually played, never actually pitched, never actually bat, never did anything, even though he was apparently there in the stadium for a while, dressed in his uniform, ready to go, should they have asked. He was there with his uniform on, but did he really play on the team? Every January, gym membership swells. By February, it's back to just the regulars. Just because you have a gym membership, does it mean you're in good shape or do you actually have to work out? You're affiliated at one level or another with a church. Just because you come a couple of times a year or maybe write a check, does that mean you're a serious follower of Jesus? These are some questions to keep in mind as we walk through the passage today. Because Paul is going to really keep asking us, are you really playing on the team or are you just present? So we're going to be reading from Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1 today. As a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. And now drop down to verse 11. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So we're actually now beginning the second part of the book of Ephesians. The first part ends with the doxology that was part of Matt's sermon last week. And so now in the second half, Paul is going to take all of the theology that he has laid down, all of the teachings about being saved by grace through faith, and he's going to talk about the implications of that now in the last part of this letter. And so he's going to basically be giving some lists of how receiving grace by faith can impact our lives. So starting with verse 1, he says, I urge you to live a life worthy, worthy of the calling you have received. This is Paul asking, are you on the team? Are you really on the team? You've been given grace, but are you living in it? Or are you just showing up wearing the uniform? A couple things to note about the verse. First of all, live a life worthy really has a better verb in the Greek. It is to walk worthy. In verse 1 and then down in verse 17, the word is walk, not just live. And I like the idea of the verb to walk because walking implies a journey. And it reminds us that our faith is not just a one and done thing. It's a journey. Okay, you said the sinner's prayer or you were moved at a Christmas Eve service. That's the start. That's not the be all end all. It's a journey with fits and starts to be sure, but you're on your way somewhere. And spoiler alert, the place you're going to is to become a mature follower of Jesus. So I like the idea of walking. And in fact, when the Covenant Church was first founded, there were two questions were at the, that were at the core of discipleship in the Covenant Church. And one of them was, how is your walk? 
because people realized from the very beginning that it took a daily encounter with God to grow in him. The second interesting word that's there is that um, if this is translated, translated, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Bit of a different meaning. It actually says calling with which you have been called. And I like the emphasis there on calling and you being called because it emphasizes God's actions towards us. Sometimes we think it's all about us. But this reminds us that God is the first actor. God calls and then we respond to God. So live a life worthy of the calling with which you have been called. So there are a few implications to that. The first is personal life change. Maybe that's what you think of when you think about living worthy. Morality, ethics. Your relationship with Jesus should cause you to become a more moral and more ethical person. If you're really on the team, you should be a good person. If you're really on the team, you should be able to be trusted. What you say you believe should actually pan out in the way you live. And if it does, then you'll never have to worry about being caught out in a lie or as a hypocrite and you won't do any damage to the cause of Christ. So we should be different. And the motivation for being different is that we're loved, we're accepted, we've received God's grace, and that gives us a different foundation to operate from. And then also, we've been given the gift of each other. And that leads to the second part, and that's the communal aspect of it. We're called together to be a part of God's plan, to share in word and deed the things that we talk about in our conversations, how we act, what God has done for us in Jesus, to develop in this church that we have together a place where love and grace and reconciliation and hope are the norms that we live in and that we invite other people into. Another way I, I thought of this is from the perspective of God, are you part of the solution? There are a lot of things that are done in the name of Jesus, but I don't think all of them are part of the solution. So how do you live life worthy of the calling that you have received? What's the nuts and bolts of that? Well, that's verse two. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. So what does a life worthy of the calling you've received look like? Humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with each other, and peacekeeping. So let's unpack that a little bit. So humility, what does it look like to be humble? It doesn't mean to be a carpet. It doesn't mean to falsely, you know, not recognize that you're good at some things. It's really humility as opposed to a sense of superiority. Humility as opposed to feeling better than everybody. Years ago, when we were living in Stockton, uh, the city manager drove up to Napa, got blasted out of his mind, and drove back to Stockton. Lo and behold, he gets pulled over by the California Highway Patrol because he is drunk. So the officer comes up to his car and asks him for his license. And the city manager looks at him and says, do you know who I am now? If you have to ask that question, the answer is either no or I don't really care. And humility is the opposite of that. And of course, the, the big guide for us is not the city manager Stockton, but Jesus, where in Philippians chapter two, Paul talks about how Jesus empties himself of anything that might have been superior and becomes humble. And Jesus himself gives us this picture of him washing his feet, which is, doesn't sound like a good time at all, but Jesus knows their feet need to be washed and he doesn't go, this is below me. He just sees the need and he does it. So humility is understanding who we are as a result of God's grace. I'm a sinner saved by grace. I'm, I'm not above anything. I, I should start from a position of humility. 
There is this really wonderful tradition around how the emperor of the Austro-Hungarian um, Empire was buried. When the last pretender to the Austrian throne, Otto von Habsburg, died in 2011, so not that long ago, they had a huge state funeral for him, and then they brought him to the burial crypt of all of the Habsburg emperors of Austria. And the person at the leading the funeral procession knocks on the door of this abbey. And from the inside, you hear this voice. And the voice says, who is here? And so the person answered, Otto of Austria, former crown prince of Austria-Hungary, prince royal of Hungary and Bohemia, of Dalmatia, Croatia, Slovenia, Galicia, Latomeria, Illyria, Grand Duke of Tuscany and Krakow, Duke of Lorraine, of Salzburg, Styria, Carinthia, Carniola, Bukowina, Grand Prince of Transylvania, Margrave of Moravia, Duke of Cilicia, Moderna, Parma, Piacina, Gustala, Auschwitz and Zatar, Teschen, Fruili, Dubrovnik and Zatar, Princely Count of Habsburg and Tyrol of Kieberg, Gerizia, Gradicia, Prince of Trent and Brixen, Margrave of Upper and Lower Lusatia and Istria, Count of Hoerns, Fieldcrest, Bregenz, Sonnenberg, etc., Lord of Trieste, Kotor and the Windic March, Grand Vovo, of the voidship of Serbia, etc., etc. And the person on the other side of the door says, we don't know him. And so the person tries again. And this time he says, Dr. Otto von Habsburg, a member of the, the Pan-European Union, member of the European Parliament, the name of uh, all of the things that he had ever done. And this voice comes back, we don't know him either. So now, for the third time, the person at the front knocks on the door and says, Otto, a mortal, sinful human being, at which the door is opened, and the monk says, so he may come in. Humility is an awareness that the ground at the foot of the cross is level. Humility is an awareness that we don't have our act together. Humility is an awareness that all we are and all we have is a gift from God. Humility is also an awareness that we may not have all the information and we might even be wrong or mistaken. Humility. Gentleness. How do you define gentleness? Well, sort of like humility, let's look at the opposite. The opposite of gentleness is harshness. And nobody likes to be treated harshly. We have parking places at our church that are reserved for people who have mobility issues. And one day, this is years and years ago, somebody parked in one of the places and another person came up and really harshly just lambasted them and said, those are places for people who have mobility issues, who are handicapped, you have no business parking there. And it was just super harsh. What they didn't know was that the person who parked there had issues that made walking very far very difficult for them. And as you can imagine, it created a lot of ill will. I appreciate the fact that people want to make sure that we save the close-in parking spaces for people who actually need them. But instead of being harsh, what if they had inquired and were gentle about it? Hostility isn't good for relationships. And God is all about building healthy relationships. Gentleness conveys a sensitivity, a desire to not destroy, a desire to not harm. If, if you have to say to somebody after you've spoken harshly, I didn't mean anything by that, the damage has already been done. We're called to be gentle. Patience. Patience literally means long temper. John Chrysostom, who lived from 347 to 407, which the Archbishop of Constantinople said, to be patient is to have a wide and big soul, a soul big enough to endure annoyances and difficulties and just the chafing that happens in relationships over the time. I really like that, long temper, wide and big soul. It's very similar to this idea of bearing with one another in love, which was literally putting up with each other in love. And this is not the same as excusing bad behavior. It's just, 
what you got to do to be in relationship with people sometimes. And the word there is agape, which if you've been around Christianity uh, at, for very long, you're probably familiar with it. it. It's a sacrificial love. But what's interesting is that the word agape is hardly ever used outside of Jewish and Christian writings because it's such a unique idea. It's a love of a different kind of quality and character. It's a love that God gives unselfishly. And I know that I've been changed because I have a capacity to love that I didn't have before. And it's because I've been loved in a different way. So the type of love that we have received from God is the type of love that we're called to pass on to other people. It should characterize our community. And then in verse 3, Paul writes, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Maybe the most important words there are, make every effort. Because oftentimes we'll keep the bond of peace, we'll keep the peace if it's convenient, if we're not too irritated, if this or that. But Jesus doesn't cut a slack there. He says, make every effort to keep the peace. Sometimes you have to count to 10. Sometimes you have to let things slide. Sometimes you have to give up your preferences. I mean, at an annual meeting, I'd rather lose a vote and preserve a relationship than win the vote and lose something far more valuable. Make every effort to keep the most important thing, the peace. I think God is far more glorified when we can keep things together than he is if we keep separating ourselves out and building walls. I think what God is looking from us, for us is to become cultures of unity and reconciliation. I mean, what could be a greater sign of the reality of Jesus among us than for us to be committed to one another in love and to demonstrate what reconciliation looks like? And I think that is so important now because as a society and even in so many churches, we have lost the ability to disagree civilly with someone else. If there's a disagreement, we have to destroy the other person. And God calls us to something different. Paul goes on, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. One, 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 one. There isn't just your church and my church and my God and your God. There's only one. It's supposed to reinforce the corporate nature of it all, which is very different to our usual understanding, which is it's me and Jesus, and the rest of you must be doing your own thing. There's just one church. There's just one baptism. There's just one Lord, one spirit that we all participate in together. But in this unity, this oneness, verse 7, but to each one of you, each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. So there's this diversity of gifts that we have in the body. And the diversity of the gifts actually helps build up the unity, which is a little strange maybe for us. Because a lot of times we think that being the same encourages unity. But what if we all had the same gifts? What if we all thought alike? What if we were all dreamers and no one was a doer? It wouldn't be heaven on earth. The staff has been working through uh, uh, what's called Working Genius by Pat Lencioni, which I highly recommend to any, everybody. And it does a great job of pointing out different gifts as we work together. So Lencioni's model is called widget, W-I-D-G-E-T. So there are the people who wonder. Those are the possibility thinkers. Invention how to do what the thinkers come up with, discernment, deciding whether it's a good idea, galvanizing, that's pulling people together to work on the project, enablement, that's helping, getting things done, and tenacity, seeing things through. And it's just this great example of how if you get all these people with different gifts together, you can accomplish great things for a company or for a, a church. We all have different gifts, and if we use our gifts together, if we all play on the team and bring what we have to bring to that, a beautiful thing can happen. So, verse 11, 
Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So these verses are not really about spiritual gifts. There are other passages like Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 that address spiritual gifts more. This is about the mission of the church and how we all fit together to carry out the mission that God has given us. It's like when there's a task and we look around and go, it'd be really great if we had someone who was good at, and we know that God has given us that person. We know it if that person's playing on the team and using their gifts. So, but some of the gifts are named and the purpose of the named gifts is also in there. The named gifts, the pastors, teachers, apostles, evangelists, are there to bring people to completion. That's what become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ means. To complete the journey. You got this thing started, and this is the goal of your walk. To complete the journey. This is what playing on the team looks like, being completed and working on that. Brings people to completion for works of service, for the building up of the body of Christ. And note that all of those are communal and relational things. They're all about how we interact together. So pastors are given to help bring people to completion. It's like being a coach. Everybody in the congregation has a gift, but we get to help you learn how to use it. Sometimes we help people find their slot, their spot on the team. Sometimes we coordinate efforts so that people work together. We help everyone to play their role or their position so that the larger purpose can be achieved. Works of service that we're supposed to be equipped, equipped for reminds me that it's not just head knowledge. Your faith should drive you to do something, to use your gifts, to actually play on the team, not to just gather more knowledge for yourself. And it's all geared towards building up the body. That's the goal. And that's why we all need to play on the team. That's why we all need to figure out what we have to contribute to the team and to the cause, to the mission. Verse 14. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. It's hilarious because the assumption of verse 14 is that we are currently infants and we need to be equipped and built up. I love what one commentator said about this infant passage. He said, immaturity is a person who does not know where to find the source for truth and life and who is repeatedly duped. I love that. Because so often, I, how many times have I watched somebody who maybe even has been in the church their entire life, but they're chasing around all sorts of places trying to find a source, of, a source of truth or a source of life and they don't find it. I love this definition. People who don't know where to find truth and life and who are repeatedly duped. I don't even want to talk about that. Verse 15. Instead, instead of being an infant, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its worth. Speaking the truth. Truth there is a verb. Truthing in love is what it says. We think of telling the truth as license to be harsh. I'm just telling it like it is, or I call it like I see him, or to be a jerk, or to tell people but we, what we really think about them. But remember the previous comments of, about gentleness. But that's not what's going on here with truth as a verb. Truth is something that someone does. After all, if you say it's true and it doesn't affect how you live, do you really believe it's true? And particularly in the Semitic context, truth focuses on being able to rely on someone. Truth, true thing, the verb, is primarily a relationship term for loyalty to the covenant. Sometimes it's translated as faithfulness. And maybe it comes to us a little bit in our phrase, she was as good as her word, or he's as good as his word. That's true thing. 
A truthful person is someone who lives out their covenant obligations in what they say and in what they do. You can't live truth and not keep your promises. We know this, this right? I mean, I have people that will tell me stuff, and I'm like, well, we'll see if you actually do it. And then there are other people I know that if they say they'll do it, they'll do it. It's a little ironic that the people who follow Jesus, who says he is the truth and the life, sometimes can't be trusted. Many of you will remember Bert Talcott. He's a longtime member of our congregation, I think a seven-term congressman from Salinas, California. And I was talking to him uh, about Mitt Romney when Mitt Romney was running for president. And we were talking about Mitt Romney being a Mormon and different things. And one of the things that Bert said to me was that as a congressman, he'd been stabbed in the back many times by Christians, but never by a Mormon. And that really made me stop and think. Are we truthing? Now, there's these amazing contrasts in the text. You have infancy versus maturity, tossed about versus joined and held together, deception versus speaking the truth of human origin versus from Christ, crafty people serving themselves versus honest, loving people serving others. And it all really comes back to whether you're playing on the team or just hanging around. Growing up in Christ, leads back to this final image that Paul has in this passage, and that's a body. And if a body doesn't grow, it dies. If we look around, there are plenty of churches that are dying. There are plenty of churches who won a battle that they chose, but ultimately are losing the war. People don't need another place that just affirms what they already believe. People need a place that tells them the good news about the fact that God loves them, that there's a place of healing and redemption and belonging and where their lives can be changed because that's what a mature church looks like and that's what Paul is driving us towards and that's what we want to be like. So let me ask you a couple of questions. Number one, what is one step you can take to more fully live worthy of the calling you've received? Number two, what's your growth area? Humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with people, or keeping unity? And number three, what do you bring to the table to build up the body of Christ?